Oh my goodness, it's Thursday. Hello, Dr. Barth. Hi, Eric. How are you doing? I am amazing because tonight we have an amazing guest. Uh, you know how we've been playing around with this REN programming language? Yes. Yeah, well, we got the author of said REN programming language to come and tell us all his hidden secrets. Uh, I've also been reading his book. He has a book. So, um, so shall we welcome our guest? Let's do it. Uh, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's amazing. Bob, Bob welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. How's it going? Uh, quite excellently. Uh, so uh, many of our viewers may not know a lot about Bob. Uh, you've been in the programming it's language scene for quite a while. I know. It's the, it is their <laughs> loss. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those who, who, who do not know? Do not yet know Bob. I can tell a little bit about myself. Um, oh man, what a what an interesting unstructured question. Uh, so oh the short God. summary is that I'm a software engineer at Google, uh, programming language nerd. Uh, my job now is I work on the Dart programming language. Um, Heard of that one? Yeah, <laughs> I imagine you have. Um, before I did that, I was a game programmer. So I worked at. EA Electronic Arts for about eight years, oh. worked on Madden and Superman Returns the Video Game, which was not a good game, and a bunch of other games, a bunch of other tech. Um, used to be a UI designer, uh, did video production for a while, pixel art. My career path doesn't make any sense. Uh, How does working in like the video game industry compare to working at a company like Google? <laughs> the hours are a lot better. <laughs> good. Uh, so it, in along almost all axes, it is straight up better being at Google. Google is a wonderful, wonderful company. And uh, EA is, Google's a really wonderful company. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to, to have you say <laughs> bad things about your former employees. But I was wondering, like, I always had the impression for, maybe Madden is different, but I had the impression in a sort of game studio, you, you work and you create this game, right? And mm -hmm. then you ship it, and then you sort of move on to the next game. But yeah. maybe Madden is such a, like, evolving franchise that it has this yeah, so, yeah that's it. true so a lot of games you know that it works almost like the film industry where it's sort of you gather this team together and you do this huge push and then everything kind of dissolves at the end right um it's gotten less true over time because now more and more games have an online component which means there's the sort of continuous process of shipping even after your initial launch um mm -hmm. madden because it's a sports title and it ships annually uh is is different so it has it has that feeling but it's also a an explicit yearly cadence right so there's this big push every year and then you kick it out the door and then everyone takes a breath and tries to like regain some sanity and then you you kind of do it again um and it, it makes for an interesting development cycle because no matter what it's got to get out the door yeah. at that point in time you have to ship every year like madden cannot not ship uh and that means any engineering work you you do is either not on the critical path at all, which means it won't get resources. Or if it's on the critical path, you better figure out a way to do it in less than a year. You have like about an eight month dev cycle once you take yep. into account beta and bug fixing and stuff like that. Um, so it it constrains their their development processes in a lot of strange ways, right? Like it's hard for them to do big refactorings and rearchitecture and stuff like that, unless they just like eat the pain and just cram it in really hard. Um, you know, when I was at Apple 15 years ago, they also had a like a, a yearly dev cycle. I don't know what it is these days. Um, and yeah, I just, like it, the big the big WWDC push, right? Yeah, and you know that like you know there was a month out of the year that you were like I I have not done this at Google, but I did at Apple sleep under my desk. Um, yeah, I've uh, I've pulled all nighters before. I uh, it's rough. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's kind of fun when you're in your 20s and you don't have a lot of other obligations in life to just be like look how hardcore i am uh but you know the novelty definitely wears off after a while but somehow after being a, f a film set design did, did i hear that no, right i just worked at like i did like video production i worked at a company that did uh like uh educational videos so like you know when you're in health class in high school and you're watching stuff about like you know don't do drugs things like that Th that's I you. worked for a company did that, did that. yeah that's, that's literally me <laughs> I got so to, somehow after you did um health class videos and music, you did a bunch of programming languages somewhere? Yeah, how did you get into programming languages? Are you like, like a vampire? That like, where is this? <laughs> where do you find the time? Yes. I mean, <laughs> no, but yes. 
Uh, so the story for, <laughs> that's, that is a extremely on point. The story for how I got into programming languages is, you know, I have some interest in them for a long time because like I, I programmed and programming languages are super cool. Um, but the thing that got me really interested in them was uh, I was working at EA, I was doing tool stuff, which meant I was mostly doing C-sharp programming, uh, a lot of .NET stuff. Mm -hmm. F-sharp had come out and I was like, oh, F-sharp looks interesting. I'll learn about this. So I got a book on F-sharp um, and I was like, that's kind of cool. Um, and then I had my first kid, my daughter was born. And she was born uh, five weeks early, so uh, she was in the NICU for a while. She's totally fine. Um, but after we brought her home, you know, she was getting fed every few hours, 24-7. Uh, yep. And the way that my wife and I made that work is I was basically just nocturnal for a couple of months. So, like, yep. I would go to bed at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I would just mm -hmm. be up all night so that I could get the nighttime feedings. So for this, like, months-long period, you know, uh, I was just like sitting around the house with three hours to kill between yep. these feedings. And I was like, well, I got to come up with something to do. And I had this book on F sharp and it had a uh, F sharp has um, their own version of Lex and Yak integrated into the language. So it, it's uh -huh. very easy to write Lexers and parsers in F sharp. And I was like, Oh, right. that seems like a cool little project to do. I could try to make a little programming language. Oh. Uh, and then I was like, whoa, this is the the most fun thing I've ever done. And then I just got super into it. So I was just, you know, doing a bunch of like hobby programming language stuff, like spending all my free time on it. Um, and then those you know, that was kind of right that... around the time that I left EA and got the job at Google. And then eventually mm -hmm. after about a, about a year, I finagled my way onto some programming language related teams at Google. And then, and, and now here I am. Hmm. So when we're doing it in F sharp, is that... Did that then run in the common language runtime or was it like an mm -hmm. interpreter yeah. or like? Yeah, I was just oh. doing little interpreters that ran in the CLR. I had, you know, no idea what I was doing, right? Like I was just like, you know, totally just like level one amateur. I just wanted to see if I could make a thing yeah. go. Uh, you know, the the ostensible, the ostensible motivation was I was like, yeah, I should do a little project while I'm on paternity leave. And I was like, well, I want to put something on the web so that users can actually use it. And it's like, oh, I mm -hmm. guess like. You know, I have like a little shared host for my own domain and it's like, well, it supports PHP. And I was like, I don't want to write PHP. It's like, <laughs> maybe I'll make a little program that just transpiles to PHP and then I don't have to write PHP. I can write my, my real project in this other language. And then I, I don't even know what the real project was ever supposed to be, but I never, ever, ever got to that. I just instead just yeah. like straight up just did languages the whole time after that. And I've never written a useful program since. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to highlight one of the things you said there, because I think that's part of the theme of this show, is you talk about being a level one amateur. And I just think that, like, that's just the whole ballgame, is that, like, even I'm 20 years into, you know, being a professional software engineer, and the only way I get better is just to continue to be a level one amateur at the next thing. And right now, you know, last week and, and next week, uh, Adam and I are being level one amateurs, or maybe we're level two now, at writing a garbage collector. Oh yeah. No, no, uh, we're still I'm, level one. <laughs> like, level one. It, I, it hasn't actually been compiled into something useful yet. So that's I, right. <laughs> I've felt like a level one garbage collector programmer for a surprisingly long time. I'm not sure where level two is, but, but I'm not there yet. Uh, yeah, GCs are GCs are this weird mixture of like, you know, the like the basic algorithms are like dead simple, right? Like Mark Sweep mm -hmm. is like this much code, right? Yeah. But then actually feeling like I know what I'm doing, like I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know. They're weird. There's something weird about them. Well, as I think you know, we wrote a Ren. You know, we should talk about your programming languages because I, I know you have more than like a dozen or whatever. There, there are many. <laughs> but we wrote a Ren interpreter. More languages than users. <laughs> and now, well, so, yeah. Um, but now we're working on, on a garbage collector for said Ren interpreter because we initially in, did it yeah. in Rust, which is. In Rust. How's that? In Rust. How does that There's work? a little bit of fighting the Rust compiler to convince it that a garbage collector is like a legit way to deal with memory because yeah. it definitely is not cool with what's going on in the garbage collector. Yeah, so I want to know more about this. How does this work? Well, first of all, taking a step back, what made you decide to re-implement Ren in Rust? Did you lose a bet? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've been a fan of, of Ren for a while. Just uh, I, I never used it for anything, but I thought the design was super elegant and like... I was particularly like taken by the implement. I mean, the implementation that you did. It's like it's just beautiful. Like it just like I, I, I wasn't surprised to learn that you wrote a book about interpreters because to me the like Ren source code is like a guide to how to write an interpreter. Yeah, the, <laughs> you know the so the the book that I wrote, which 
I can show you too. I have I have a copy of it. This is the, the <laughs> yours has massively more post it notes. Yeah, this <laughs> this is the version that I, I proofread, so it's got the the last batch wow. of post it notes. Um, man, this, this book is so large. So the this book uh, goes through two interpreter implementations. Um, the second one is in C, and that code base in the book is basically I took Ren and stripped out the sort of weird Ren specific mm -hmm. features and kind of distilled it down to something a little more kind of like classic dynamically typed language kind of JavaScript-y, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's where, you know, most of that code came from. It's where C, what is it called? C, C Cling or something? What? Oh yes, yeah, Clux. Yeah, yeah so, Lux but, but is the language and Clux is the, the second implementation. To answer your question, like there's a certain amount of, uh, you can gain by reading source code, mm -hmm. but I think you only really understand something if you're trying to implement it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you think about like, oh, okay, maybe we should try implementing it in C, but then it would just be too easy to like copy and paste the code and like transliterate it. Like you wouldn't really learn as much. And so yeah. then we said, oh, like maybe we should pick a different language to do it in. And so Rust seemed like, you know, a low level language that you could potentially write an interpreter in, but also not directly one for one what was going on in the regular Ren. Yeah, so that, it's that's enough the difference process. to make you think about the semantics and not just sort of treat it as a transliteration, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So is this your first book? I was under the impression you have a pass no, of those as well. this is book two. Uh, book two. I, have, I brought I brought props to this interview. Uh, this is this is my first book, uh, Game Oh, Game oh, Gamer. This is also the copy edited version of it. Uh, so wow. This is a unique one of a kind artifact. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I started, uh, that first book when I was at EA, I was a game programmer. Um, and it's on, um, you can think of it as like, uh, design patterns, volume two. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. like a collection of software design patterns. Um, it's sort of skewed towards games, uh, because for a couple of reasons, um, but actually the patterns in them are, they're just software patterns. You can use them in lots of different kinds of code. Um, I started working on that when I was at EA because, uh, there was a lot of poorly architected code that I had to deal with. And I was like, man, I wish uh, I wish some of the people around me knew more about software architecture. Uh, there was a lot of good code too, uh, sure. but people, not as many people were learning from the good code as I wanted them to. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is true for other places in the game industry, but you know, the vibe that I got there was that uh, there was a sort of cowboy attitude among the game programmers of like, well, we can't do this the software architecture stuff like we're we're low level game programmers we don't have time for that we got to we got to worry about bytes and frames and and it was you know it was just nonsense right and so i thought if i made a book about software architecture specifically for game programmers in c++ mm -hmm. that maybe they wouldn't have as much of an excuse to sort of disregard it um okay. and you know just i wanted them you know i wanted it to be easier for people to to make games um so i started writing the book i also i wanted uh I wanted to leave EA. I was, you know, looking around. I was going to try and find another uh, game industry job, and I thought, like, oh, having written a book would be a nice way to pad my resume. Um, and then I ended up getting the job at Google before I finished the book. Uh, so, that, <laughs> so how does this work? Do you, do you just like wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to write this book, and then you like take out a, a typewriter and you start typing, or like, how, what what is the like first step towards writing a book? Or like, how... so I. I'd had a, I have a blog and I'd had that blog for a few years and I'd written, you know, blog posts on stuff that I was excited about. Um, this is around the time that like Reddit was first taking off and like in the early days of Reddit, when it was very like nerd focused, it had this like really, really active, engaged programmer community. And it was, it was just super invigorating. I don't know if, if you guys were on Reddit around that time, but it was like, it was just like, all they were the nerds. startup across the street. I oh, was, yeah. I was in YC with them. Um, oh wow! So, so what? Are, what? I, whatever I'm saying is not relevant. What? What? Are, what are those folks like in person? Get, tell me early Reddit stories. I, I that may be for another time, but uh, they I'm sure are both different. Fifteen years later, um, yeah. but they were both wonderfully pleasant <laughs> um, gentlemen. I actually used to go and and hack with with Alexis quite often. Oh wow! Um, but you know, we we haven't spoken in fifteen years. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if. Were you guys, act, are you active on Reddit? Do you, are you Redditors? Do you Reddit? I don't think I have an account. I probably visit the site like every day to see what's on the front page. And uh, I don't know. I, I like, there's some of the subreddits that I go to sometimes. Like the, I like the personal finance subreddit because I, I don't know, <laughs> it just appeals to me. Yeah. But I, I don't, I'm not like active. I wouldn't say I'm active in the Reddit community at all. I'm, I'm more active in the Hacker News community. Like 
if there's a um, article about something that I know something about, sometimes I'll I'll post it. Yeah. I would loading up Hacker News today. I don't load it that often. I was uh, remarking to myself how fast the page loads. It's it's a lot better now than it used to be. Yeah. Well, I just I, in comparison, so much of the internet here. This is the you know decade plus of working on browsers. So much of the internet loads so slowly, mm-hmm. and Hacker News just being the simplest. You know, I mean, it does nothing in the client, right? Like it's yeah, it's just like a it loads super fast. Yeah, it's like but, Web one point so, right? You, you, as you said, you have like a dozen your programming languages. Where where did Ren come in? This, was it your first? <laughs> no. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, my first programming language was this language called Magpie uh, that went through several different ar- incarnations. So at various points in time, the word Magpie referred to radically different languages. Mm. Um, and it was kind of like, as I was getting into programming languages and learning more about all the different kinds of languages out there, it was like, I'm going to stuff that feature and that sounds awesome. And I would get super excited about <laughs> something, which is why it's called Magpie, right? It is just like this collection of all the shiny bits that I could find. Mm. Um, so it kind of <clears throat> changed a lot over time. The It's dead now. I don't, uh, I don't maintain it or work on it or anything. It basically, uh, I came up with a language that I'm not sophisticated enough to implement in a usable fashion. So it has like this cool set of features, um, but I wasn't able to like get a VM that worked quickly enough. And like I'd started writing a VM in C++ and then got to the point where I was writing the garbage collector. And I realized that uh, using, (laughs) so the object model was implemented in C++ classes using inheritance and virtual methods for doing specific stuff for the different built-in object types, you know, strings, numbers, whatever. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then I had a a garbage collector that's, that's a a copying collector, right? Which is a cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. And those two things do not (laughs) interact very well at all because uh, you'd be in the middle of a virtual method and (laughs) the the entire instance would move out from under you. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to have to rewrite the entire VM. Uh, And then I, I didn't. (laughs) We are learning the difficulties of doing a copy collector right now. Yeah. Um, we, have a, we have a question for you from the chat. Am I? No. The short answer is no. Uh, I don't have any plans to make uh, a part two of game programming patterns. I'm, thank you for really liking it. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, one of the strange things about writing a book is, or writing two books is afterwards, people are like, I like your book. Uh, are you going to write a book about this? It would be great if you would write a book, write a book about this. Uh, which I totally appreciate as a compliment of like, this person would like to read more of my writing, but subjectively I experience it a bit like, you know, a woman who has just completed labor being like, are you planning to have any more children? And it's like, <laughs> I would like to take a break and not be writing for a while first. Um, so, but like, like having it, like how, how long did it take to write crafting interpreters? Just like a six ballpark. years. Six years. So is it, that's a significant, yeah. significant effort. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, I wasn't, you know, so I, the, the trick that I came up with for my first book, uh, cause I'm, I'm not, I'm not good at finishing anything, right? Like I have all these programming languages that are half finished that no one you uses. You clearly right? like finished I, a few things, sir. I have finished a, a small number of things. Um, and the trick that I stumbled onto for my first book was to work on it every day. And mm-hmm. because I am an obsessive perfectionist, I would hate to break that chain. And that was enough to get me to push through and get it done. Wow. Uh, it totally works. It's this weird thing that like short circuits my brain. Uh, so when I started writing the second book, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do the same thing. Um, so I worked on it almost every day for, uh, for about six years. So when I finished wow. the, finished the manuscript, got to the last chapter, uh, mm-hmm. took a break for a little while before I went and did the print edition. Um, and then when I did the print edition, I decided to loosen my rule a little bit and give myself the weekends off. Uh, like, but for the first four years, day. literally every, like over a thousand days in a row. Just, did, did you draw the acts too? I drew every illustration. Uh, you'll, wow. you may notice that the lettering in the illustrations is like handwritten, hand lettered right. every single illustration in the book. You right, now it's like crafting books. Like it's not just crafting and <laughs> yeah. I it, it took me like nine months to typeset it. Like it's. There's, well, this is probably a sign of mental illness on my part, right? Like I went way beyond obsessive into. I mean, it's <laughs> gorgeous, thing. and it's huge. Dion, Dion too, has right? a couple like, ones for you as well. You know, so so my first book is like uh, 
I think it was like 89,000 words, 90,000 words, which is like decent sized, you know. And I found my my notes that I wrote when I was thinking about writing my second book and I was like, this is going to be a small handbook, something more focused than the first one. <laughs> and then it just gets out of control. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's like a phone book, right? It's it's like 240,000 words. It's, it's a wow. very enjoyable phone book. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, we have more more questions <laughs> from your adoring fans. Oh, boy. Wow, there are questions. Uh, so uh, what are my favorite programming languages? Um, it's kind of like asking a chef what their favorite food is, right? I have such an intense love of programming languages that there's no way that I could really like sort them. I think many, many languages are super cool for various different reasons, right? Like I, I like Lisp and Scheme. I think Smalltalk is like conceptually brilliant. Um, the whole ML family, family of languages is really cool. Uh, I love, I enjoy programming in C more than I should. <laughs> I feel like a, a vague <laughs> sense of shame for using it because it's so unsafe, but it's like C has a certain feel that's, that's particularly satisfying. Uh, okay. Even C++. I don't like other people's C++, but I enjoy writing my own C++ in my own style. Um, Somewhere in C++, there's a subset the that's thing about particular C++ to every is, human being on Earth. Yes, exactly right. And no one will agree on what that subset is, right? So no. it's like, yeah, everyone, yeah, your own C++ is the best C++, and everyone else's C++ is horrible, right? Mm -hmm. um, what about a scheme interpreter? Have you ever, ever written a scheme interpreter? That's a great question. I've started writing scheme interpreters a number of times. Um, I would love to sit down and just be like, yeah, I'm going to do the whole thing. Uh, I've, you know, I've, you know, browsed implementations of scheme. Uh, I've read books on scheme and Lisp, uh, but I've never, I have way too many personal projects as it is, so, but I've never taken the time to like fully write a, a complete scheme interpreter. Um, I thought the joke is that you couldn't avoid writing a scheme interpreter. Like if you wrote any other language, somewhere deep inside would be a scheme interpreter. <laughs> I have written many of the pieces of a scheme interpreter in the context of other random languages. I, I toyed with a little hobby language for a while that was um, sort of semantically like scheme in that it was homoeconic. So like the code was a first class data structure in the language and mm -hmm. it had macros and you know, dynamically typed, but it had a syntax that was like kind of like small talk. So it was like sort of like scheme, but instead of the only data structure being just an ordered list, it had this sort of like slightly different syntactic structure or weird. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, scheme is super cool. It'd be fun to, you know, sit down and just like, there's something, there was something really appealing to me about just like, I'm gonna go in a cabin in the woods for two months and do nothing but come back with a scheme interpreter, right? Uh, and you know, at a practical level, there's something actually really interesting about it to me because doing, you know, so I, I, I would be more interested in doing a scheme interpreter that is something like either a bytecode compiler or like a compiler to C. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, scheme also has macros, so you can't kind of just purely do that. You also have to sort of have some level of interpretation and figuring out, like, how do you architect that in a way that makes sense? Uh, super interesting to me and I've always wanted to sort of like sit down like okay I'm gonna push through understanding it because I don't quite get how that stuff works now and I would really like to hmm. um we do have uh, actually quite a number of questions I don't know that we'll get through them all um Boy. but uh it looks like we were asked if you had recommended books well there's this great book <laughs> in my prop department <laughs> I have <laughs> um yeah that's a good question. I'm literally sitting in front of my, my programming language bookshelf right now. Um, this sounds weird because like, if you're looking for a first book on programming languages, like part of the reason I wrote this was because I didn't feel like there was a good starter book. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, you know, I do think it's, it's a pretty good first one. Uh, there's a pair of books by Thorsten Ball called um, Writing an Interpreter in Go and Writing a Compiler in Go. Those are also really nice introductions, uh, especially if you like Go, uh, if you enjoy that language. Um, those two books sort of work like the, the two halves of my book kind of structurally. Um, he's also a really good writer, approachable writer. I like his writing style. Um, if you have read an intro and you're sort of past that and you want to dig deeper, then it's mostly a question of like what direction you want to go in, right? So if you want to know uh, 
kind of more of the classic compiler theory stuff and you want something that feels a little more grounded in the fundamentals, then the Dragon Book is great. Uh, it's, you know, it's not the most engaging read. It's pretty dry. Um, yeah. It's not as bad as its reputation. Uh, you just kind of have to accept that it's like, yeah, it's a, a textbook. Um, I didn't get through it. Yeah, <laughs> I did. One of my other tricks is that I'm I can grind through text. I can yeah. uh, my my secret is that I leave it in the bathroom and I don't take a phone in there with me. <laughs> so oh. I, I, can, I, can, I can get through a lot of textbooks that way. <laughs> Dragon um, on the John is that? I just love that you have. I, I believe that like we were these you know crazy meat machines and we're stumbling through life, but you really have to figure out how to drive your meat machine, mm -hmm. and you have figured out some of the hacks to like make your brain work correctly. And I love it. Some of it. Yeah. It's, it still feels like a, I don't know, every day I feel like I, I am learning something new. Um, I really like the advice of, of doing like working a little bit each day on the thing. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I found that things like that have worked well for me. And sometimes I get into negative habits. Like I'm learning chess right now. And so I do these, like I do three chess puzzles a day and it just like just becomes a habit. And yeah, there's this, you know, one of the things that I'm learning for me is that is that I can overshoot that, right? Like I, uh, I can create a structure for myself that lets me keep making progress, but then I can get so locked into it that I will stick with it even when it starts to not be helpful for me because I just like the rigidity. And so now I'm having to learn like how to sort of dial things back and be like, is this actually working for me right now? Or am I just doing it because I'm a perfectionist and I'm obsessing about it, you know? So there was another, well, we're on the subject of, of driving our meat machines. Um, there was a, well, a trick I learned at the beginning of the pandemic, which was talking about dealing with sort of the anxiety of the constant choice around the, the pandemic. And do I need to, what is my masking policy? And, yeah. yada, yada, yada. and the trick was basically set yourself a reminder for two weeks from now and be like, that is when I, that's the decision meeting. And I'm not reevaluating the decision between the decision meetings. Hmm. And so I could imagine in, in your say, case, it's like, yeah. Do I reevaluate X policy on what cadence? I don't know. It's it, it has helped me. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. I'm gonna I will put that in my bag of tricks. <laughs> um. So we yeah. I was asking about rent. Oh my goodness, we're continuing to overflow. Uh, I think we just go through the questions. I think these are great questions. Like, sure. Sounds good to me. Do you, do you uh, give talks uh, student events? <clears throat> uh. I mean, that, that's written in the progressive tense, like there is a general answer to that, uh, which, you know, uh, I have, have I given it? No, I don't think I've done anything like academic. Um, I've given talks at conferences a couple of times. Um, no, I don't do, I mean, I, you know, I do some public speaking for work because I work in open source, um, but mm -hmm. I'm not like, I'm not part of academia. I, uh, I'm, I'm a college dropout. Like I never actually uh, took any programming languages classes before I dropped out. Um, so uh, I have to talked to, you know, one or two classes because there are some, uh, there's some professors that are using my books in their classes, which is crazy to think about because I don't know anything about actually teaching people yeah. in a classroom setting. Um, and I've, you know, kind of joined their classes just to say hi, uh, but I haven't done anything like that. If I did, what would you want to hear what would you want it to be about you speak on all sorts of topics like you speak on open source i know you also you you talked about games i i feel like all these little hobbies of mine you somehow end up i have a friend who's into i've um, actually been stalking you for years this is this is this <laughs> right here is the culmination <laughs> look behind you <laughs> but i have a friend who's into roguelikes and like you showed up at, at that you were giving a talk at, at also the roguelike conference Mm-hmm. It's the, this is the, I don't want to, I feel bad saying it's the best because I feel like that's implicitly denigrating other conferences I've been to, but that conference was so awesome. The organizers were fantastic and it is extremely my jam. <laughs> so I've uh, been a roguelike nerd since the nineties. Um, you know, when I got Mac Moria on a shareware disc back when shareware floppies were a thing, and uh, I started like hacking on my own roguelike <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> and I'm still you hacking. You are a vampire is what I'm learning. <laughs> well, the, the trick is to never finish anything. <laughs> you can have a million projects if they're all half-baked. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been you know tinkering on and off on this roguelike for many, many years. And it never gets anywhere close to being done. It's like the, it's a moral equivalent of like, 
you know those dads that have like an HO train set in their basement that they're always building but never gets never get to use. But it just gets more and more elaborate and like yeah, more and more that little is, trees. That's, <laughs> yes, that is what my roguelike is. And then like every time I change jobs uh, and start using a different language at work, I end up rewriting it in that language. So then mm. I just tear everything down and like you know lose even more progress. Um, but I've been tinkering on that thing for uh, for twenty years. Honestly, you know my first book, a lot of those you know, architectural patterns were stuff that I stumbled onto when I was working on this, this dorky roguelike. And I was like, oh, I'm going to write something about this. Uh, so going to that conference was like, it was, it was fantastic. It was awesome. That talk was recorded. Uh, if you just look for probably my name and roguelike on YouTube, uh, it'll turn up. Uh, it was really fun to give. Um, to do the, I had a good time too, because so my, the current incarnation of my roguelike is written in Dart, which is a fantastic programming language. You should definitely talk about Dart. And it compiles to JavaScript and, and runs in the web. Uh, so, <clears throat> so my roguelike now is like basically a, a web app, right? Like it just like, you know, it just runs in the browser, talks directly to Canvas. Um, so I was putting together this presentation. And I was like, oh, how am I going to present this? And I was like, I'm going to take my, my roguelike. I'm going to take that engine, tear the game out, but just keep the little pixely terminal renderer. And I will make the presentation be a program. Uh, so <laughs> all the amazing. slides... In, in the talk, like all the text and stuff like that, there's like little transitions and animation and like it's all like pixely roguelike, you know, terminal looking. It's all just like my game's engine running live. And there's like even like there's a couple times where it is just running the dungeon generator in the background. It was like super fun to get to like put all that together and just like be like, I'm going to 100% nerd out just to the max. <laughs> it was great. Roguelike That's celebration. Incredible. If you ever get the chance to go, super cool. Uh, we have another question about... Uh, Racket? I don't. I don't know Racket. Racket is uh, so it used to be used to have a different name. It was I think it was PLT Scheme before it was Racket. Uh, so it <clears throat> it's like a it is a scheme. It's in the Scheme family. And you know the Scheme community is interesting, right? Because there's a bunch of different participants in it that are using Scheme for different purposes. And a lot of times they pull in different directions, right? So like a lot of the scheme community is using it as a teaching language and they want it to be minimal, self-contained, as few features as possible. Um, but then other parts of the scheme community are like, we want to use this for, for practical purposes. Uh, so we want it to be a full feature general purpose language. Um, other people are using it as a foundation for programming language research. So they want to be able mm -hmm. to explore all these different variants and those kind of pull in different directions. Yeah. And PLT scheme was was one of those, and eventually, what they decided to do was rename it as Racket, so that they felt that they had more freedom to kind of evolve in the way they wanted it to be. So Racket yeah. is this really cool system where it's a scheme, but it's a scheme that kind of comes with an IDE. It has a bunch of extra libraries and stuff built in, and then it has this uh, this sort of principled way of building language extensions within it. Right. So mm -hmm. Racket is almost like a family or a tree of languages on top of it, which is really cool. I've you know, I've read about it a bunch uh, because you can hear me blathering about it. I haven't, I've written tiny bits of pieces of code in it, but I've never, you know, really sat down and like, you know, used it in anger for anything real. Uh, but I think it's- Used it cool. in anger. Yeah. I don't know where that phrase is from. I didn't come up with it, but somehow it, it there's something, there's something great about the phrase. Cause like, there's a point where you, you don't, you don't really use a thing until you reach the point where you're mad at it. You know, it's like, you know, cause that, that implies you have some investment in whatever it is you're doing with it, right? <laughs> I feel like every system that's beautiful is like has that quality of like just sort of not really being used for something. And by the time you use it for something, then like there's always limitations and always these things. And yeah, I've, I definitely felt that emotion. Like, yeah, it's like Bauhaus furniture, right? It's like yeah, it looks like geometrically perfect and beautiful, but then you sit down on it and you're like, it's uncomfortable because <laughs> the shape of my posterior is not a geometric platonic <laughs> solid, right? <laughs> so if you're gonna make something that is actually comfortable and usable for humans like you the the messiness has to sort of invade it at some level right uh this one maybe as much for adam or do you <laughs> your thoughts Dr. Yeah, nice adam, are you writing a book would you like oh i mean uh, crafting operating systems uh we are reading um tannenbaum's book uh on on the future team to learn about operating systems. Um, That's what William Leslie says on the chat right there, yeah. 
that's yeah, the book it's, it's... that I hear about too. I don't know. I know nothing about operating systems. Uh, that's on my list of things where I'm like, I am a level zero operating system programmer. And at some point it would be really cool to become a level one operating system programmer. But uh, I don't know if I'll ever find time for that. Yeah, I find I, I uh, like there's a lot of really good information in that book. I find myself disagreeing um, with a bunch of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I have a dream of someday writing an operating system book, but like maybe I just have to spend a day, a day on it, you know, for six years and I'll, I'll get somewhere. But it, that, that seems just, I, that seems insurmountable to me at the moment. I'm, I'm like yeah. deeply in awe of, of you having done it. Uh, it's just work. It's just text. It's just like sentences, right? You just make a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, I am <laughs> just like, I, you I'm know, wearing you know. my Serenity OS shirt today. So <laughs> you could, uh, you know, you could always spend some time reading its source code. Um, yeah, maybe Kling will write a book like that. that uh, he wrote he a good one, I bet. Your point about disagreeing with the Tannenbaum book is interesting. Uh, you know, I've read a bunch of PL books, and uh, what I've come to feel is that, like, I like books that I disagree with, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like, one, that's a good signal to me that I'm starting to internalize enough stuff to start having opinions. You know, I'm not just, like, taking it in uncritically right i'm starting to kind of like synthesize things and it means that the thing that i'm reading cares enough to have a position and i would much rather read a book that is like that than a book that it's like i can't disagree with anything because everything has so many qualifiers that i'm like did i actually consume any actual information so um you know i'm i'm definitely willing to recommend a book that i think is half wrong if it's wrong in like an interesting way right yeah there's actually a thing in like um in Dart has this sort of interesting uh, initializer syntax where you can initialize the fields of an object, but you don't get access to this until you're done with the initialization phase. Mm -hmm. And uh, af after I learned Dart and wrote a ton of Dart code for Flutter, I um, went back to hang out with some of my academic friends and I went to some PL talk where they were like breaking down, these are the different families of ways you can initialize objects in programming languages. And they just like skipped that one. Mm -hmm. And it was it was like, well, well, what about this? Like, you didn't consider this case that you could have this interesting phase where you had the arguments, but not the this and stuff. And so, like, th that's the kind of thing that I, I find in Tannenbaum's book is that, like, there is implicit assumptions mm -hmm. about how an operating system needs to work mm -hmm. because all of the examples that he's seen work that way. But, yeah. you know, you, you don't have to make those choices. They're like, and I feel like in programming languages, even more than that, there's so many choices you can make, like many choices you can make in programming languages, I'm sure are terrible. It would make for a horrific developer experience, but there's so many, I think that we haven't explored as an industry yet. Yeah, that's, there's this weird balancing act of like, you know, you need to learn from the experts to not waste time making the same mistakes, but not totally learn from them because otherwise you'll just stay entrenched, right? And like having, figuring mm -hmm. out the, you know, the balance between that is kind of tricky. And it's extra hard in languages too, right? Because so much of, programming language design is heavily, heavily dependent on user expectation. You know, mm -hmm. there are there are many things that you could do to make a programming language just objectively, purely better and simple and more elegant, except that the weird kludgy inelegant thing is already loaded into 10, 10 million programmers brains and you're just like stuck yeah. with it. And so it's like path dependence, you know, so like my job now full time is like working on the, the Dart language itself, like designing language features and path dependence is my life, right? It's just like, in a perfect world, this would be different. But this is where we are now. And this is the history that is in people's heads and that, you know, and the millions of lines of code that have already been written. So where do we go from here? You know, so, so I'll be the ignorant one. What What's path dependence? Oh, yeah, it's a weird term. So path dependence is it's hard to explain. Um, it's kind of like when you're when you're evaluating a system, <clears throat> you have to take into account the the historical steps that would have let you get to it. You can't just say like, if we had the system today, it would be better because if you don't have a mechanism where you could have arrived at that in the real history that you were living in through that, mm -hmm. that's not a valid system, right? So, you know, the, the canonical uh, story that people tell about it, which I think is actually not true, is how, uh, what is it? Something about how the spacing between railroad tracks 
has something to do with like horse carriages because it was like, well, they, you know, the, they had the roads were this wide because of the horse carriages. And then when they started converting the roads to train tracks, they had to keep the same size. And it's like, there's no logical reason for the trains to be that size, mm -hmm. but they were building on this historical infrastructure. So yeah. here we are, right? Um, or, or there's an extension of that, which is the shuttle uh, boosters are the size they are because they had to be carried on trains and the trains had tracks that were a certain width. Yeah. You know, it just keeps going on like into the space age. Like we're, we're going to be orbiting Mars and things that are defined in these terms, because that's, that, that's yeah. how we got, that's how we climbed the tech tree. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. huh. yeah. yeah. Climbing the tech tree is, is exactly the, the right way to think about it. And, uh, and it, it's pervasive, right. You know, and there's, you know, there's, I think, you know, I think a lot of the sort of psychology of people that get into programming are people that like things to be sort of neat and systematic and kind of black and white and logical and coherent and they don't and efficient like i think like and like efficient yeah small like conceptual consistent. additions giving you a lot of yeah like and effect. they don't like you know they don't like the fact that we're sort of we can't wish away history and just design pure things elegant from scratch um but unfortunately that is that is what we do so language design is this weird balancing act of like how do we make a thing that feels as you know modern and simple and consistent based on what we know today but also still leverages all of the expectations and knowledge that is already loaded into people's heads even when that knowledge is not internally coherent right you know mm -hmm. uh, and it's this it's a weird strange balancing act right like doing like syntax design for a language is very strange because like all the principled choices you don't really get to make it's mostly like what's the thing that is going to be the most familiar to the most people yeah, so for those coming in late, you work on the Dart language team. That's your current day job, besides the 18 hobbies that we've already covered. Yeah. Um, and so tell us, like, because I've never worked on a language team. What is that like? Like, what do you, what does one do? Like, what are you most proud of? Like, what, what, what contribution in the Dart language? You're like, yep, nailed it. I'm really glad I did that. That is, that's multiple questions. Oh, <laughs> sorry. You can take them in any order or, or, or either. <laughs> Uh, I'll do it in chronological, well, no, I'll do it in reverse order. The language feature I'm most proud of is um, collection if and collection for. Oh. Mm -hmm. So inside, in Dart, you know, we have, uh, you know, square bracket list literal syntax, like, you know, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, and we have curly brace map syntax, like most other scripting languages. And uh, a couple of years ago, year ago, I don't know, time has no meaning, a couple of years ago, uh, I designed a couple of small features that let you use if and for. They look like statements, but they're not statements because they're inside a literal. Uh, you can use them inside the literal and they kind of, they do what you want, uh, basically. Um, and those are my answer because they're features that I, I directly personally designed. That's like, you know, 80% me, right? Um, with a bunch of help from other people on the on the language team. That's but, all engineering is. You know, I I wrote the proposal top to bottom. Um, whereas most of the language work I do is very collaborative, and it's like you know it's you know lots of you know input from different people, and it's kind of a group effort. Um, so I don't necessarily think those are the best features of Dart. But they're the ones that are the most personal to me. Um, also, I think they're actually pretty neat little features um, because they're they're you know they're really syntactically very simple, right? It's just like. It's literally just an if and for, you know, uses the exact same syntax of if and for statements, uh, except you can stick it in a literal. Uh, it's kind of neat because it's a it's a novel feature, right? Other languages don't have that feature. They have things that look similar, but they're not exactly that. But almost everyone can figure out what it does the first time they see it. And that's that's a hard trick to pull off. So it's I thought it was really cool. You know, we did usability studies before we launched it and they guessed right. And I was like, OK, this is cool. Well, it's very conceptually efficient, right? You already know what an if statement is. And like, mm -hmm. if you had to guess, like, what does an if statement do if you put it here? It's like, well, I guess it either puts the thing there or it doesn't. Like, it, mm -hmm. But there's an makes interesting sense. question like, of like, okay, so imagine you have a list literal and it has an if and there's no else. And if the condition is false, what do you think you get? Do you think you get an empty list or do you think you get a list containing like null? Because a lot of people, when they look at this, their mental model is, oh, this is just an if expression, right? which is what it would be in like Ruby or something. Um, but it's not because in the case where the if the where the else case doesn't get evaluated and there is no else, you get nothing. It, it, it doesn't, it's not an expression that evaluates to a value. It's an element that can evaluate to 
one or zero values, and then the for loop, you know, can evaluate to any number of values that then get interpolated directly into the surrounding collection. So it's like it's a it's a neat little feature. Um, it works beautifully cool in Flutter because, because so, you often have this case where you're building up a widget list and you want to sometimes add something or sometimes not, right? Yeah. So that was the the direct motivation. So the the Flutter team came to us and they were like, hey, you know, we have, you know, these, you know, Flutter widgets, you know, the declarative UI is in imperative code. And mm -hmm. we're like, how can we make this more beautiful and have, make it feel more declarative? And one of the things that I saw looking at a bunch of Flutter code was you start out with this nice nested, simple declarative tree, but then you need some conditional logic right in the middle and you end up having to hoist that out and then do some imperative mutation of that list that you're building up. So, mm -hmm. so with the collection stuff, it was like, okay, well, we can give you this in the language and then you can keep that right in, you know, embedded in the tree. So it, you know, it solved a sort of tailored user problem that we were trying to fix. It has a syntax that users can intuit, so the learning cost is pretty low. Um, mm -hmm. And it is satisfying for me too, because uh, I got the idea. I'm like a super programming language, like history nerd. I read about- Oh? What's that? I said, oh, I, <laughs> if you, you had wanna... another hobby, I, I hadn't- I mean, I just, didn't... it's not like a separate hobby. It's just like related to, I am into programming languages. So I'm into all of them, right? So I just mm -hmm. read about, all sorts of weird ones. And um, I spent a bunch of time reading about this, this language called icon that is it's basically dead. It's not around anymore. Um, okay. But it has this concept of uh, generators where every expression in icon can yield any number of values. And it has this sort of execution model where it will kind of, in some cases, keep running code. It's, it's really hard to describe. And I don't, I don't feel like I fully understand it. Um, it's like a little bit prologue, but not quite prologue. Um, but it has this idea of things that look like expressions can yield, you know, one value, maybe zero values on failure, maybe multiple values. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then, so we started looking at this Flutter code and we're like, oh, we need a way to have collections where sometimes you have a value and sometimes you don't have a value. And I was like, oh, I can take this idea from icon and try to like paint it to look like C syntax and, uh, people will be able to use it without really thinking about what's going on under the hood where they're like, oh, when my if condition is false, the whole thing just evaporates, right? It's not just an expression. Um, so it was cool. It's a really fun feature to work on. That uh, is one of the fascinating things about Dart. And I think we've actually talked about it on the show before is that like we've done user studies with Dart, the language you worked on, and people have written in it for hours, not knowing what the language they're writing in. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, so I have this blog and I've, uh, you know, written blog posts where I just use Dart as the pseudocode and like, I don't say that it's Dart and everyone can read it and no one really thinks about what language it is. It's really cool about that. Hey, one of your, your fans here has probably yes. what you read. Yeah, I've read, I haven't read it all the way through. I've, you know, read lots of bits and pieces about it. Uh, that's on my to read list that I never get a chance to sink into. I think I skipped some questions, but but here's one. What are my favorite talks? Of... This is going to sound bad. I don't watch a lot of talks on YouTube. Um, oh. I'm super text oriented. <laughs> I'm saying this while doing the on a live stream. I'm sorry that I'm <laughs> indirectly bad mouthing this format, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty text oriented. I'm really good at uh, absorbing information that's written. Uh, you know, I like books. I like blog posts. I particularly like books. I think you know when the web got big. I think people sort of forget the value of reading a single narrative put together as a coherent work by a single author. I've, I learned a ton of stuff from the web. I've read many, many Wikipedia pages, um, but there is something to be said for books too. Uh, I, so I don't tend to watch a lot of uh, talks on YouTube. Um, I don't watch a lot of live streams and stuff like that because like, I wanna be able to, I don't know, sort of control the pace that I absorb information and you know, pause and resume and stuff like that. Uh, I do spend a, a lot of time on YouTube watching synthesizer videos these days, uh, but that's that's different because it's sound, right? Like the sound is integral to the experience. I want to underscore a point you just made because um, I have discovered this in my old age that the importance of the written word um, and just as I have sort of gotten back into reading as, my, as I found more time in my life, just how interesting it is to just like step into someone else's brain and see how they arrange words differently. Um, and also I just learned more that if I actually want to sort my thoughts, I have to put them down on paper. Yeah. And these are things that I just don't think I understood 20 years ago. Um, and I think that we, 
not to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, I use the internet all the time, but I think that we risk um, losing with other formats because I do think there's something powerful about the written word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the, you know, I so I got into writing because I started, I was super active on Reddit and I was commenting on Reddit on all the time oh. and I was having all these Reddit discussions that were like very invigorating and, you know, talking to strangers on the internet is not always a positive rewarding experience and learning to get my point across to strangers on the internet, especially on Reddit, um, yeah. is a really, really good exercise for making sure that I do actually understand the thing and I understand it well enough to present it in a way that can be absorbed by other people. Right. So I got, got super into Reddit and then eventually I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I want to start writing blog posts. I have stuff that I feel excited about, you know, that I want to share with other people. And that process of writing blog posts was like just a incredibly valuable, just mental organizing exercise for myself. I write, I have blog posts that I'm sure zero people have read. And, you know, one of the things I do now is, uh, I just write notes to myself. Right. So like, you know, I've been getting into music the past couple of years and, um, you know, I just have these, like, I mean, they're essentially like journal entries. They're like blog posts that are just for myself and uh mm -hmm. just the exercise of writing them is uh is really valuable yeah it just helps me organize yeah, so before the show I, I watched a few of your your music videos on your youtube channel do you want to you want to plug that for a second for folks so they can check it out uh sure uh so uh uh so my my name on youtube and soundcloud is tiny wires um i'm a you know mediocre hobbyist musician uh but that's okay i i'm a middle-aged synth dad i think i have <laughs> discovered that there is like a category i am in a category of people of like 40 something dudes that you know decided to get back into electronic music with hardware synthesizers and sort of relive their youth this is like the midlife crisis like you know our dads were like you know buying t-birds and like restoring them in their garage and like this generation's equivalent to that is like being like a, a synth dad. Um, so you say get back into it. Does that mean you, is this something you had done uh, earlier in life? Yeah, I, uh, uh, back in my twenties, my college days, um, spent some time making electronic music using a mod tracker back when mod trackers were a thing. <laughs> um, and then later in my twenties, uh, when I was living in Florida, I was in a couple of rock bands. So I played bass in a, in a couple of bands. Um, and, which is awesome, super fun. Uh, if you ever get the chance to like play music with other humans, it is, in my opinion, one of the the like top five human experiences is like making a sound, a coherent sound with other people is just the best. Um, but w once I had kids, uh, I did not have you know the time in my life to to be in a band, so that kind of took a backseat for about a decade. But um, conveniently, right before the pandemic, I was like you know, getting bored and stir crazy. And I was like, I need some novelty in my life. And I was like, maybe I'll get back into music. And then, uh, and then that timing worked out really well because like, I'm not doing anything else. Um, okay. So tell me about like, why, why hardware synthesizers? Like I naively as a computer person, I would just imagine software synthesizers would be the like way to go. Like... Oh man, we could do a whole other hour on this. <laughs> uh, so the short answer is I do both. Uh, so I have some hardware stuff that I'm exploring. And then I also use Ableton live and kind of make music, uh, you know, I make some stuff entirely with hardware. I make some stuff entirely in software. I make these days I tend to do kind of a mixture of both. Um, I find it's, it's super fascinating. We could have a really long discussion about this. One of the things that I think is really interesting about electronic music specifically is that there's no set workflow, right? Like if you're in a rock band, the way rock bands make rock music is there's a couple different ways, but it's, it's fairly straightforward, right? Like, you know, maybe one of them, maybe one of the members sits down with an acoustic guitar, figures out the lyrics and the chords, you get together, you jam, and it, you kind of, there's just kind of a process. But for electronic music, there are like a million different workflows. So part of, a big part of what determines any particular musician's like sound is the, the workflow they create for themselves, right? It's mm -hmm. like very, it's like this weird thing of like, to be an electronic musician is like, First, you build a way to make music, and then you make music using this bespoke machine that you have built that lets you make music, and everyone has their own weird bespoke machine, right? Um, and then it's this I find weird... this is true of, of visual artists, too. They have a process, and yeah. the process tends to inform the kind of work that they create with the process. Yeah, totally. Like, you look at, you know, painters, and like, especially, like, action painting and stuff, where, like, the all the stuff that 
you don't see on the canvas, but was the thing that they made the canvas is very unique, right? And kind of leads to that. Um, and music right. is the, electronic music's the same way. So uh, figuring out how to make electronic music is this weird process of like trying different workflows. So it's like, I'm trying some hardware stuff and trying software stuff and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what is the, the thing that works the best for me. Um, what I was particularly interesting is, is at least the way it's presented on, on the YouTube channels that you're performing the electronic music live. Whereas I think of electronic music as being a very highly produced thing that's like assembled systematically, and I, yeah, so do you find the live process is 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 uh, yeah yeah there, there, there's some of both. So um, probably two thirds of the stuff on there is uh, is actually uh, kind of performed and arranged live. Um, it's this weird mixture of, this is one, another thing that's interesting about electronic music is like, how much do you let the machine do and how much do you do yourself, right? Like with a guitar, you got to play all the chords, right? Like there's no like, I'm going to press play on the guitar now. Uh, mm -hmm. but with, with hardware and with software, like you have total freedom as to how much is pre-sequenced and how much is controlled live. And that's a, that's a thing that you have to make these artistic choices on, right? Um, so about two thirds of my videos, uh, I'm, you know, using some various hardware that has a sequencer built in. And usually I have a couple of patterns made and then I'm doing the arrangement live. So I'm bringing in different instruments and tweaking sounds, you know, kind of to, you know, turn this loop into a something that has uh, some larger structure. Um, it's super fun. It's a really, you know, enjoyable kind of tactile way to make music. It's a lot more fun than, you know, I can make more interesting arrangements in software uh, for a listener, but the process of making them is not as fun. It's not as immediate. And uh, there's also this weird effect of if I'm trying to reach people, YouTube videos that have hardware synthesizers in them get better engagement because people that are just interested in the synth will find those videos regardless of whether my music's any good. Um, <laughs> but if I make a song <laughs> just on my computer and then the video was like, I don't know, I went out and took some, you know, pretty shots of the ocean. Uh, the only people who find that are uh, they, basically there's not a whole lot right like there's not a lot to bring them to it so uh i don't want to it feels weird because as a musician i don't want to overfit towards what happens to get me youtube engagement um yeah. what's the thing you enjoy the process of creating that way that that's like a good signal that that's a you know. yeah and it's also like you know i do want my stuff to be heard so you know that's also part of the iteration loop of being a musician is like how much do you cater to an audience versus your inner voice and like how do you find that balance right and it's it's been fun to explore that um i don't feel like i really uh know what i'm doing very much but it also feels nice to like do a thing where i don't feel like i know what i'm doing so I, that seems very fitting for this podcast we literally have a banner <laughs> we have that one just in case anything ever goes wrong <laughs> it's <laughs> true we have no idea what we're doing either it's also so, it's so nice having something tactile you know, because like mm -hmm. let's sit and stare at a computer all day and like our sense of touch has the most brain, has the most neurons associated with it, right? We have our most really? nerves for it. And oh, like when the modern world, we just like don't use it, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, hardware synthesizers and we don't use our, don't use our hearing very much either, right? So like getting to have a hardware synth that, uh, you know, here, let me, let me grab one real quick. Oh man, he's got visual aids. Yeah. It's also got like 10 things plugged into it. As we deconstruct the process set up here. <laughs> it's okay. I just finished the, the latest, latest track. So this is a thing called a, it's called a, a digitact or a digitact. And it's like, it sounds oh, good, right? It's got like nice little clicky buttons and it's got very nice encoders. And like, it just feels good to put your hands on it, you know? Oh. Um, so, I don't know. So we're, no, to say that. we're just about at time. Mm -hmm. um, are there questions we missed? Questions we should have asked you? Are you asking me or are you asking the audience? I'm asking you. Uh, I didn't get quite all the audience questions, but we got most of them. I don't know. What an interesting meta question. I don't know. You <laughs> the, me, at the end of the interview, that, they always that you ask missed? you this question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this was amazing. I learned so much. We uh, didn't even get to talk about modular synthesizers. I mean, if you want to really nerd out, like we could go, we could go deeper. <laughs> that one's got the circuit, the circuit board exposed. <laughs> now I'm terrified. Yeah, that, that's the other hobby I got into during the pandemic was like actual electronics, uh, and that is like I really have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, 
Well, anyways, we loved um, we loved seeing you, uh, and we I have enjoyed your book very much. Thank you. Um, and we are continuing to enjoy writing your programming language in Rust. Thank you for re-implementing my language and finding a bunch of weird, nasty bugs in memory. Like, what was it? You, you found an issue bug. where you can uh, it will just cast a pointer to the wrong type or something, right? Like in the C implementation. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you wrote in C. It's it's unavoidable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's the experience of writing in C right there. <laughs> Anyways, um, been fabulous hanging out with you both. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for coming on, Bob. Cool. See you all. Good night. See.